Hello and welcome to Type Systems. In, in this class, we'll be uh, we'll be uh, discussing many different type systems and proving many different properties of them. Um, I'm uh, I'm looking forward to uh, to lecturing to you, and I'm also looking forward to uh, uh, talking to you in person this year. So uh, please please feel free to contact me. Okay, so type systems. So what are they? And that the surprising thing about them is that they actually uh, they're actually not one thing but two things. So type systems lead a double life. So um, nearly any programming language that you use these days will have a type system. And even ones that started out without a type system, like Python or JavaScript, these days are growing type systems such as TypeScript and MyPy. And so. So the type systems are an essential part of uh, modern programming languages, and they do things uh, that help do helpful things like keeping you from adding six in to file. Um, but it turns out that types are also a fundamental concept of logic and proof theory. And so what this means is that uh, the the science of type systems forms a really uh, a really satisfying link between theory and practice. So you know they're they're one of the biggest channels for connecting results in theoretical computer science to practical programming language design. All right. So um, you know we can ask what are type systems used for, and they actually have a lot of different purposes. Uh, the uh, one of the most important uh, one of the most important purposes is to support uh, error detection via type checking. So you you can think of the uh, types as annotations on your program, saying what you expect the uh, behavior of the program to be, and the type checker checks to make sure that the program that you wrote is actually consistent with those annotations. Um, and so obviously this is very helpful for, uh, for error detection, but it's also very useful for, uh, for, for structuring programs and helping to, uh, helping to uh, uh, develop them as well. So we, we talk a lot about abstract types where we uh, introduce some, uh, some, some type structure that's known to the implementation and hidden from the client. And so from the point of view of a client, it looks like you've introduced a new primitive type. And so that makes it easier to understand the program. And the names of those types are actually very good documentation. Um, and you know, beyond documentation, it's also useful in an IDE. This is actually the, the big motivation for, uh, for languages like TypeScript. They add a type system to JavaScript, not to make things faster, but so that the IDE support can be better. But you know, types do make things faster, um, or can, I should say. And so if you're interested in uh, in compiling uh, and compiling code efficiently, it's uh, it's good to ensure that the uh, that the basic primitives of your language can be mapped mapped to uh, to machine primitives. So when you add two integers, you'd like to be able to know that add, you're only adding two integers, and you don't need to go through this long uh, long list of conditionals. Like you know, well, I have two variables, and I see a plus sign. Am I uh, adding two integers? Am I adding two floating points? Am I concatenating two strings? Am I writing a string into a file handle? Um, all of if uh, if your language lets you express all those possibilities, then there's a, uh, a good chance that like there's going to have to be a runtime test to figure out which which avenue to take. Um, and if you have a type system that's uh, that's uh, good enough, then you don't have to do that. You see you see x plus y, and you know both of them are uh, are are uh, word-sized integers, and so that program can simply be compiled to a single add instruction in assembly. And the the reason people turn to type systems to assist with this is that uh, um, they also want a guarantee of safety. So in a Python in a Python compiler, there's actually nothing stopping an implementer, um, well, besides sanity and good taste, from See, uh, seeing an uh, operator like plus and then saying, I'm going to assume that everything has been gotten right and I'm just going to issue a single machine instruction to add things together. And as long as you're sort of on the happy path, that might be okay, but if, if, the, uh, if, you're try if you have a string object and you add a number to it, well, now you have like some nonsense answer. And so what the type system, uh, uh, what a good type system, a, a sound type system will let you do is it'll give you a guarantee that like the, uh, that when you're, 
when your types say that you're adding two integers, that's all that it can possibly be. And so the uh, so it's safe to implement things efficiently. Um, and this this saves the uh, programmer from trying to have to debug um, like errors that sort of exist outside of the uh, outside of the model operational model of the language. So if you've done much C programming, you've know you've probably seen that this is a a, a common source of uh, of difficult to debug situations in C. So C doesn't have a type sound type system, and that means that the um, errors at runtime don't necessarily have to end in like a nice exception or segmentation fault. They can silently corrupt your data structures and memory, and you can have arbitrary uncontrolled behavior of your program if there's a mistake. And a sound type system can rule that out by saying, okay, um, you're always sort of staying within the, uh, within the correct performance, within, within the uh, in correct implementation envelope. And so all of the errors that your program exhibits are, are naturally part of the, uh, of the language semantics. So they can be explained in terms of the program the uh, programmer wrote rather than the object code that that pro program was compiled to. Okay, so um, now what we're going to do is we're going to, um, in part, recap what you, must, what you should have learned in semantics last year. Um, and so we're going to start with a really basic type system. I'm going to start with almost the simplest language you can think of. This is going to be a language of booleans and integers. So we have, uh, we have primitives like, uh, like true and false, and we have some natural numbers, and operations on expressions. We're allowed to add two expressions together. Um, we're allowed to compare two numbers to see which one is bigger than another. And then we also have some logical operations, like we can take the conjunction of two booleans or maybe the negation. And so when we have programs like this, note that we can mix numbers and uh, Boolean expressions. So some of these combinations will make sense. So if you add three and four, that's fine. If you add three and four and uh, add a comparison to see if it's less than or equal to five, that's also okay. And if you have two, uh, two expressions, two, uh, two comparisons, like three plus four is less than or equal to seven, and seven is less than or equal to three plus four, we have these two Boolean expressions, it's, uh, it's okay to combine them with a, uh, with a conjunction. So all of these expressions sort of make sense when you look at it and try to understand it. But there are other, other terms that don't make any sense. So what does it mean to take the conjunction of four and true, or to see if three is less than or equal to true, or trying to add true to seven? So none of, these, uh, none of these expressions make any sense because we don't know um, what kind of logical value 4 might be. We don't know, um, we don't know uh, what numeric value true should be, so how can, we, how can we add it? And so we can write some programs, but we have this, uh, we, look at the, we look at the grammar and we say some things make sense and some things don't. And the point of a type system is to help you rule out things that don't make sense and identify the ones that do make sense. And so what we're going to do is we're going to introduce two types to our programming language. We're going to have a type of Booleans and a type of natural numbers. And so now we have this grammar of, of, of types, bool and nat, and then we have this set of terms, which is the same as on the previous slide. So Boolean expressions and arithmetic operations. And so the thing that we want to do is we want to connect program terms with types. And so um, intuitively you look at this and you know what to do, but when you're doing mathematics, you can't say that's obvious. You have to actually say what you're going to do. And you know, in mathematics, okay, maybe you can have, wave your hands, but if you're trying to teach a computer how to do this, there's no, there's no alternative to like specifying things um, really clearly. And so the way that we're going to specify typing is by a typing judgment. And so what we're, we're going to do is we're going to write e colon tau to, uh, as a, as a two-place relation, meaning that the term e has the type tau. Um, and so you should think of colon as being uh, a relation between terms and types, and you can sort of think of it as an infix relation membership symbol. 
Um, okay, so how do we, so we want a relation, a relation saying that terms have types, but how do we define such a relation? And the answer is we're going to define the typing relation by means of a set of typing rules. And so a, a typing rule is a set of rules for building a tree. And what we're going to do is we're going to say that we're going to have certain leaf formers for the tree. We're going to say we have the num, the num rule or the num tree constructor, and it tells us that any numeric literal has the type of numbers. And similarly, the Boolean literals true and false, they both have the type of bool. Okay, and now if we have these, uh, these basic, uh, basic formers of, uh, uh, of, of the relation, of the typing relation, we can also build larger trees. So if we happen to know that E has the uh, a derivation tree telling us that E has the type nat, and another derivation tree telling us that E prime has the type nat, then we can form a bigger uh, derivation tree using the plus rule to tell us that e plus e prime has the type nat. And similarly, for Booleans, you can say something like, okay, if I have a tree telling me that e is a Boolean, and a, t a tree telling me that the term e prime is a Boolean, then I can use this and rule to build a bigger tree that tells me that e and e prime is a Boolean. And so the way that you should read this is, you know, the bottom of the tree gives you the conclusion, the type for your whole program, and above the line are the premises. And so as long as the premises are met, we're allowed to form the conclusion. And, and so, okay, I've told you how to build some trees. Here's an example of one. So if we want to give a typing derivation, and these trees are called derivation trees, and so if we want to build a, uh, a typing derivation tree for the expression 3 plus 4 is less than or equal to 5, then what do we do? We say, well, we have a less than or equal to, and we have to check for less than or equal to that each of the uh, left-hand and right-hand sides are natural numbers. Okay, well, now we need to check that 3 plus 4 is a natural number. And how do we do that? Well, now we have this plus sign right here. And we have a plus rule, and it tells us, well, check that 3 is a number and that 4 is a number. And if we know that, then we're licensed to show that 3 plus 4 is a natural number. And since we also know that 5 is a natural number, that's enough for us to conclude that 3 plus 4 is less than or equal to 5. And so you can see how this derivation tree propagates, uh, gives types to each of the subterms of your program, like sort of recursively. And so, so we have a tree, and the existence of this tree tells us that 3 plus 4 less than or equal to 5 is a program with the type of Boolean. All right, so that's, that's okay. Um, but let's make things a little bit more complicated. Suppose that we decide to add variables to our language of, uh, language of arithmetic and Boolean expressions. So we're going to have an, a variable reference x, and we're going to add a let form to let us bind a variable. So what we're going to do is with the let x equals e and e prime is where we want to say whatever the result of e is, bind it to x, and then evaluate e prime. So e prime is allowed to refer to x, and the value of x is determined by e. Um, okay, so we can say, all right, well, now we have variables and let bindings. Now what we need to do if we want to, our, uh, to use our type checker is we also need to extend the typing relation to handle, handle the new things we've added. But how do we decide, when we see a variable x, how do we decide what time it is, type it is? Um, we don't know what it is. Maybe it's a Boolean, maybe it's a natural number. Um, if you just see the bare variable, you don't know what refers to it. And so, in order to be able to give a variable a type, the typing judgment has to know what all the variables are and what their types are. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to extend our typing judgment. So now this is read as gamma, tell, uh, under, under the assumptions gamma, e has the type tau. And this gamma, this set of assumptions, is actually just a list. It says this variable has that type. 
So, you know, let's look at the grammar for context. And you can see it's just a list. It's either the empty list, or you have a list of, of variable type pairs and one more variable in its type. And so, in most of the typing rules, this gamma is just going to be propagated through. So this gamma is storing the types of all the variables and for checking the, uh, the terminal things like number, numeric, and Boolean literals, the gamma plays no role. And when you're doing an addition, e plus e prime, uh, we put gamma, we, we use the same gamma when we're type checking e, and we use the same gamma when we're type checking e prime, because a variable can occur in either the left or the right hand side. Um, the only place where variables appear in the typing rules is down here in the variable rule where you, we say if x is a variable then it has the type tau assuming that x colon tau actually occurs in the context gamma. Okay, so that part makes sense. Um, the part which is a, a little bit more advanced um, still, still should be familiar from you, to you from all your programming but maybe a maybe a little bit new if you're trying to formalize it is how do you type let x equals e in e prime and under the assumptions gamma? Well, obviously um, e has to be well typed under gamma um, and so whatever e's type is, that's the type we want to give to x. And so let's put it into that context. We're going to say e had the type tau and now we're going to assume that x has the type tau since e's result gets bound to x and we'll type check e prime having the type tau prime in this enlarged context. So in e, x is not in scope, but in e prime, x does occur in the context. And this sort of captures the uh, thing you're used to from programming where you can't use a variable until it's been defined, until the variable is in scope. Okay, so this, this looks like a really nice type system, and it's totally going to type check arithmetic and uh, Boolean expressions. And now you look at it and you say, okay, it's obvious that this is a good thing, but how do we prove it? We want to, we really want to say that no bad terms are left in this type system. Um, but how do we do that? And in order to prove that bad terms are real or ruled out, we have to prove what's called a type safety result. This is going to be a proof that whenever you have a well-typed program, it's always going to like, you know, do something sensible rather than getting stuck on something incomprehensible. Okay, but before we, before we talk in detail about the, uh, about the semantics of the programming language, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about substitution. And the reason is that we, as soon as we introduce variables into a language, you need to talk about what substitution means because we're, we want, we've introduced let x equals e and e prime. And so we have this idea in mind that x stands for e inside of the body of e prime. Um, so how do we actually get e into the body? And so what we're going to do is we're going to give the definition of the substitution operation. And we're going to say, set, uh, substitute e for x into the body, uh, into the body of, the, of the expression. And as long as no variables occur inside of these, uh, inside of these terms, the substitution operation simply isn't going to do anything because none of true, false, or numeric literal have any variables inside of them. Then, for the binary operations, well, when you substitute e for x into e1 plus e2, well, the obvious thing to do is to substitute e for x in e1, and then once you're done with that, substitute e for x in e2, and then return like their sum. And the same goes for all of the binary operators, like uh, less than or equal to and and. And so now comes sort of the interesting cases of substitution. So for substituting e for x into a variable z, then whether this substitution does anything depends on the relationship between x and z. So if x and z are actually the same variable, then we're trying to do a substitution and we've found the variable we're trying to substitute for, and so the result will be e. 
But on the other hand, if the variable z is not, is not equal to x, then its uh, substitution isn't going to do anything. It's just going to give you back the original variable. And when you substitute e for x into a let binding, well, that's just going to happen homomorphically the way, way you expect. So we're substituting e for x into a let binding, and so that means that we need to uh, substitute e for x into the first subterm e1, and then we need to substitute e for x into the uh, second subexpression e2. And um, this, is the, this is the only case in the definition of substitution where something slightly tricky happens. Um, namely, we have to make sure that this variable z doesn't collide with any of the free variables of e. And so if you just alpha rename every binding as you go along, this, you'll get, sort of get this for free. Okay, so now we have substitution. And now that we've defined substitution, we can prove some properties about it. Um, so the first property that we're going to prove is a property called weakening. And it says that if we have a term E that has a type tau, then what we're allowed to do is we're allowed to add an extra assumption right into the middle of the context, and E will still have that type tau. So we're saying if a type term types x in a context, then it'll keep on type checking in any larger context. So, you know, it type checks in gamma gamma prime, and we said, well, if you added x colon tau double prime, nothing would break. And we have to say, yes, that's okay. The other thing that we have to prove is that the order of variables in the context doesn't matter. So uh, we said earlier that the context is a list of variable type pairs, but it actually turns out that the, uh, that the exact order doesn't matter. Um, and this is actually something that we're going to need to prove. And once you have this property of weakening and exchange, those are all the lemmas that you need in order to prove a substitution property. And so if we have a term of type, uh, of type tau, then, and we have a, uh, another term, e prime, with the type tau prime, then what we can do is we can substitute e for x inside the body of e prime. And so we're saying we're replacing a, a type correct term for a variable, and, um, and everything, everything works. Like type safety, type correctness continues, is not broken by substitution. Um, and so that's, that's the properties of weakening exchange and substitution. So um, if you want to prove it, you have to prove this by structural induction. And so the idea is that we start with a derivation tree telling us that E has the type tau. And now what we're going to do is we're going to say, if something is in a typing relation, that means there's a derivation tree for it. And we can look at the derivation tree to construct any other derivation tree that we like. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to um, take the original derivation tree of gamma x colon tau double prime gamma prime, and we're going to uh, um, we're going to uh, uh, show that you that should yeah, sorry I slightly confused myself. We're going to start with gamma gamma prime, and then we're going to show that it's safe to insert x colon tau double prime into the derivation tree. All right, so how does this work? And the answer is, like I said before, is we're going to do this by induction on all of the typing, uh, typing rules. And so the base cases are just sort of immediate. So if you know that n has the type nat in a context gamma gamma prime, then the, this very rule num also tells you that n has the type of big N in any context. And since it holds for any context, it's all obviously going to hold for gamma x colon tau double prime gamma prime. And when we, when we want to prove weakening for something like the addition operation, what we're going to do is we're going to say we start with a derivation that tells us that E1 plus E2 has the type nat in the context gamma gamma prime. And because we have this derivation tree, it, we also have its subterms. And so we'll have a subderivation telling us that E1 has the type nat, and we'll get a, sub, a second subderivation telling us that E2 has the type nat. 
And because the derivation trees for E1 and E2 are both subderivations of the original term, that means it's safe to appeal to induction. And so induction tells us that um, E1 still has the type NAT in this enlarged context. And the same goes for E2. So we know up here that E2 has the type NAT in the context gamma gamma prime, and so induction tells us that we're allowed to stick x colon tau double prime into the context. And now that we have these two subderivations here, what we can do is we can appeal to the plus rule to, this, uh, to these two der uh, derivations to build a new derivation telling us that E1 plus E2 has the type nat in this augmented context. And so all that works very similarly for the less than or equal to and the and rules. Um, and now we're left with the uh, with question of how you prove weakening for um, let and the variable case. Okay, so let's assume that we have a typing derivation for let x, let z equals e1 and e2. And so this means we're going to have two subderivations, one telling you that e1 has the type tau1, and a second one telling you that e2 has the type tau2. And so both of, these sub, both of these derivations, that E1 has the type tau1 and that E2 has the type tau2, they're both subderivations. And this means that we're allowed to appeal to induction. But we're going to appeal to induction in a slightly funny way. So for subderivation 1, we're just going to directly apply induction to E1. But for um, subderivation 2, this thing right here, we can't just blindly appeal to the induction hypothesis because we've got some extra stuff in the context. And so we need to, uh, we need to uh, do something to take into account the fact that gamma gamma prime is different than gamma gamma prime z colon tau 1. And so what is that difference? Well, the induction hypothesis lets us work with a derivation in any context in any type. And so specifically, we will, when we prove weakening, the extended context, the stuff on the right, is just going to be taken to be gamma prime, comma, z colon tau 1. And now we can, uh, we, can, uh, uh, we can appeal to induction and get that E2 has the type nat with x colon tau double prime uh, instantiated like sort of... Uh, sort of in a bigger context. So, uh, so we're, we're instantiating uh, this, this quantifier. We are we're ranging over gamma and gamma prime, and now we're saying gamma prime in this particular inductive application of the induction hypothesis is done on a larger context. Okay, and so now we have one normal induction, one slightly fancy induction that was done on an extended context, and now we can put these two together to appeal to the let rule and get that, that it's safe to weaken the let. Um, and then the variable case is pretty straightforward. We happen to know that z colon tau is in gamma gamma prime, and because gamma gamma prime is smaller than uh, gamma gamma double prime, that means it's obviously going to, uh, it's still going to be in there, and so the var rule applies. So, okay, that was a, a straightforward uh, uh, structural induction, but we're only a third of the way through. We've got two more to go before we finish proving uh, the soundness of substitution. And so the idea with exchange is that you're allowed to reorder variables in the context. And again, the base case rules are very easy. The num and the true and the false rules, they don't look at the context. And so they're happy with any context. And in particular, they're happy to reorder the variables in this context. So those steps are easy. Um, and likewise, the, uh, the, the case for plus, it's a little bit longer, but it's not fundamentally harder. So we start um, with the uh, um, gamma x1 uh, tau1 x2 tau2 as the as the context that E1 uses, and we have the same, the same thing, the same context as the context for E2, and since this just sort of m lines up perfectly with the, uh, 
Uh, induction hypothesis, we can just appeal to it twice, once for the first subderivation and once for the second one. And so the x1 tau1, x2 tau2 becomes x2 tau2, x1 tau1. Okay. And then the less than or equal to and and rules work in like essentially the same way. The only thing that ends up being different is that the rule you use at the end is a little different. All right, so for proving exchange, for let bindings, um, now we have to do a little bit of work. And the reason is that when you see let z equals e1 and e2, e1's context is going to look just the same as you expect, and it's going to be e2's, e2's context here that's going to grow something into it. So we're going to have two subderivations, one telling you that E1 has the type tau1, tau prime in the starter context, and then the typing for E2 is going to tell you that it has the, the, the same typing as before, but in, in a bigger context. So that means that we just do induction straight off on E1, and then when we do induction on, uh, on subderivation 2, what we're going to do is we're going to invoke the induction hypothesis in a larger extended context. This one with z colon tau 1, in addition to all the stuff that was in, uh, um, in gamma prime. All right. And now when we prove, now the last thing left is to prove that exchange holds for the variable case. And this case turns out to be pretty easy for the obvious reason that if something is in a list, it's also going to be in any permutation of that list. And all we're doing, all, all, all we're doing here is we're going to take x1, change the order of the variables from x1 tau on x2 tau2 to x2 tau2, x1 tau1. So, so because all you've done is reorder the elements, this membership here is unaffected. And so we're still able to show that the VAR rule holds. Okay, so now that you have weakening exchange and uh, um, what, we, what we can do with weakening in exchange is actually to prove substitution. And the idea behind substitution is that, you know, imagine that we have two derivation trees. One telling us that E has the type tau, and the other telling us that E prime has the type tau prime, but also there's a tau-shaped hole in the context. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to case analyze E prime. And as we go through this, we're eventually going to reach terms small enough that you can simply appeal to the definition of substitution and everything should work out properly. So how does that work? Um, and so the num case is actually, uh, uh, actually interesting here. So we're going to assume that we have a natural number n, and um, if you substitute e for x into n, you still get n, and so because you want the natural number n to have the, num, the nap type, we have the, uh, we have the rule n colon n. Okay? And so now what we're going to do is we do the substitution, and this substitution is equal to n, which has the type nat. Okay, so the same thing will go for true and false, and now let's look at how to prove substitution for addition. So here, what we've got is a term e1 plus e2, and it's got a tau-shaped hole in it. And what we know is that e1 has the type nat with a tau-shaped hole, and we know that E2 has a, uh, an, a tau-shaped hole labeled with X. And so what we can do is we can say, well, each of E1 and E2 is smaller than E1 plus E2. And so we can simply appeal to induction. And we can say, well, now we can simply appeal to induction to show that substitution worked on E1 and E2. And once you've done that, you can use the rule plus to show that e for x e1 plus e for x e2 actually does, uh, does uh, give you the, the thing that you want because this line right here is equal to that line right there. That's exactly the thing we wanted um, from the definition of substitution. 
Um, proving substitution into a let is a little bit tricky. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to assume we have some term e that has the type tau. Assume we have from this let expression, we're going to say e1 has the type tau prime with the x shaped hole, with the x's temp shaped hole. And we know that e2 has the type tau2 with two variables in it, x colon tau and z colon tau prime. And so now, let's go back up to this e1. And note that it has a x-shaped hole, which means that we can do induction. And we know that e for x and e1, e1 still has the same type tau prime as before. In order to do the substitution into the body of the let, we actually have to do more work. And the reason is because of a context mismatch. So uh, the expression e that we're substituting it only makes sense in the context gamma. Um, but in the body of the let, we've just introduced a new, a new variable in scope, z colon tau prime. And so how do we, how do we, how do we handle this, uh, this change? And so the, the answer comes in two parts. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, I had this e tau in the context gamma, so we're going to weaken it a little bit and say, well, assuming you have some implementation, uh, so sorry, assuming you have some, uh, uh, some e of type tau, we can weaken it to add z colon tau prime to its context. And then for e2, which has x followed by z, we can swap that around and say, using exchanged, to show that e2 has the type tau2 even when z colon tau prime and x colon tau are both in the uh, um, are both in the uh, uh, context. All right, and so now we're actually in a shape where we can do induction. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our extended context to be gamma z colon tau prime, our whole to be x colon tau. And now we can appeal to induction, and now we know that e for x and e2 has the type t, tau2 in this larger context. And then just from the uh, definition of, uh, of uh, how, uh, just from the definition of the let rule, what we can now do is we can say, okay, well, uh, the, the whole let expression, let z equals e for x and e1 in uh, let e for x in e2, that has this type tau2, and then we can appeal to the definition of substitution to hoist these e for x's out of the term. Okay, and so this is basically like a complete proof of substitution for this language with contexts. Oh, well, almost complete. I forgot to talk about variables. And here, variables are actually somewhat interesting because we have two cases. Um, in the first case, um, x and z are different. And in this case, um, uh, they'll, sorry, I flipped this around. In the first case, um, x is actually the same as z. And so if x and z are the same, then this variable right here is actually x. And when you do e for x into x, um, you get e. And we already know that e has the type tau. Um, and so just by the definition of substitution, this case works out. Um, in the case where x and z are different, then what we know is that z colon tau is in gamma. And it is not x colon tau because x and z are not the same. And so that means that z colon tau prime is going to be in this bigger context with x added on to the end. Um, there are, I, sorry, I, I inverted it. We know that z colon tau prime is in this bigger context, gamma x colon tau. And since x is not equal to z and it's in the list, we know that it has to be in gamma. And now what we happen to know from the uh, variable rule is that uh, um, you know, z has the type tau prime because it's in the context with that. That's just, that's just uh, um, how, how, how these things, uh, how the VAR rule works. And so now we can say, well, hang on there. Um, Z 
with uh, e for x substituted into it is the same as z. And so this thing here and this thing here are just the same. Um, and now this whole thing um, is exactly what we wanted to prove. All right. So um, we have substitution, but we're not done yet because we have a little language and there's more to the evaluation of the language than just its, uh, um, ju than just the substitution theorem. So we want, if you see an expression like three plus four plus five, um, we expect that to be 12, but there's no substitutions inside of it. So what we want to do is we want to say what value a program computes to. And so what we're going to do is we're going to define an operational semantics. So we'll define a grammar of values, and then we'll define a relation that says E steps to E prime. And so what are the values in our language? Well, our types are Booleans and numbers. And so our, our values are going to be the Boolean literals true and false, as well as all the numeric literals. And the way that this uh, operational semantics works is it's going to be yet another inductively defined relation. And we're going to say, bit by bit, that uh, um, E1 and E2 steps to E1 prime and E2 if E1 steps to E1 prime. So we're saying evaluate the left-hand side of an AND, and then if the left-hand side of an AND is ever true, then we, uh, we true and E steps to E, and false and E just steps to false. And so this is giving you sort of the left to, left to right evaluation. So if E1 and E2 are a condition, then if E1 evaluates to true, then we're going to say, okay, the left-hand side is, is, is done. Now it's time to evaluate the right-hand side. And similarly for values, what we're going to do is we're going to say, when you see an expression, let z equals e1 in e2, what we're going to do is we're going to say, before you do the substitution, evaluate e1. So we evaluate e1 as much as it'll go, and then if we're left with the values, let z equals v in e2, we can just do the substitution now. We're going to substitute v for z in, in the body e2. Um, and so now we have this transition relation, and a reduction relation is going to be a sequence of translations. And what we're going to do is we're going to say a term is, when can a term evaluate? And we're going to say a term is stuck if it's not a value and we can't find an E prime that lets it step. So we're going to say, for instance, with 3 plus 4 is less than or equal to 2 plus 3, we'll say, okay, we're going to evaluate the left-hand side. So this thing will become seven. And because seven is a value, we'll, we're now going to evaluate two plus three, and that's going, to become a, that's going to become a five. And now the comparison seven less than or equal to five is going to give us false. And so this, this, uh, this expression evaluated successfully, um, but here's one that doesn't. So if we change that less than or equal to, to a uh, conjunction, it's going to evaluate to seven and two plus three. And if you look right here, we don't have any rules for having a number inter uh, uh, intersect with, a, with an expression. So we don't have any further step we can take from this expression and it's not a variable. And so um, the way you should think about it is a stuck term is a, is, you know, a broken program that doesn't have any well-defined behavior to it. Okay, and so now we can define safety, type safety, to mean a program is safe just when it never gets stuck. And so what does never getting stuck mean? Well, one, one property that you have to satisfy is value, is progress. So if you have a well-typed program, E with type tau, then either E is already a value, or you can take a step. There's no, there's no case where you have a non-value that, that, uh, that can't step. So all the well-typed programs can, are always values or can take a step. Um, and furthermore, what we're going to do is we're going to demand that preservation also hold. And we're going to say, if you give me a well-typed program, and that program takes a step, 
The result of the step is also well typed. And so you can think of it as, say, a progress is telling you that well pro well, a well-typed program is not stuck. It'll all, you can always take a step of progress as long as it's not done. And a pro preservation is telling you is that um, well-typed programs are always going to stay well-typed. So if a well-typed program evaluates, you're going to get a new well-typed program. And so any well-typed term can't reduce to a stuck term. The final term has to be well-typed if it exists, and um, well-typed terms never get stuck. Okay, so how do we prove progress? And again, we're going to turn to structural induction. And we're going to do structural induction on the derivation of E having the type tau. And one thing I want to call out here is that the context is empty. So you can, you can think of a, uh, uh, a whole program as having all the code that it needs to execute. And your variables are things that you need to link in for the program to be able to run. And so we're going to only prove progress for programs which are cold, which are closed, because they have the code that can actually be executed. And we're going to do a structural induction on this, uh, on this derivation, this typing derivation right here. Um, so how do you show progress? And in some cases, it's going to be very easy. So when you have the value cases like numbers, well, n is a value that's in the grammar of values. And so the fact that a Boolean literal can't stuck is not a problem. Okay, so how do we do progress on let bindings? Well, let's take a look at an expression, a well-typed expression, like let x equals e1 and e2 colon tau prime. It's going to have two subderivations. One telling you that e1 has the sum type tau, and the other telling you that e2 has a type tau prime, assuming that the variable x has the type tau. And so naturally, the two subterms of the uh, uh, typing derivation of let are, are, are two smaller typing derivations. And because they're smaller, we can appeal to induction. So if we appeal to induction on E1, so the, the, the thing that's getting bound, we know that E1 can either take a step or be a value. And if E1 can take a step, then the whole let expression is allowed to take a step. And in the case where E1 is, is already a value, then you don't need to do any further evaluation. You can just do a substitution, and that's, that's fine. Okay, so that was, that was not too bad. But what about type preservation? And so here we say, okay, well, if I have a, a well-typed program, E, with the type tau, and I know that E takes a step, um, then I want E prime to have the type tau. And obviously we're going to do structural induction, but the question is, what are we going to do structural induction on? Because in this case, we actually have two choices. We could do structural induction on the, uh, on the expression E, or we can do structural induction on the reduction relation. And so these are, since these are the only two inductive things we were given as arguments, they're really the only options that we had. Um, and it takes, it turns out that for getting a clear proof, the right choice is to do induction on the reduction, um, on the induction relation. And as we do that induction, we're going to need to take apart the, uh, the typing derivation um, for the program. Okay, so now let's see how type preservation works. So here we have this let expression go with, uh, with the bound variable x, e, e1 attached to x. We're going to say, well, if e1 steps to e1 prime, then let x equals e1 and e2. Okay. And then we also assume that we have a well-typed program. And so we're going to assume 
that E1 has the type tau, and X colon tau tells us that E2 has the type tau prime. And that makes sense because we're type checking this let expression and we want to check E1 before the variable exists. And then after the variable exists, we can check E2. But look up here, E1 to E1 prime is also a subderivation of one. And E1 tau is a subderivation of two. Oh my goodness. So now, what we can do is we can appeal to induction and we can conclude that E1 prime actually has this type tau. And now we can use the operational semantics for let to say, okay, uh, um, oh sorry, we can use the typing rule for let to show that let x equals E1 prime in E2 has the type tau prime because we have a desired subderivation and we have a, a term with the right type so we can put, put that together. Okay, so that case was easy because it was the congruence case, but what about the case where the um, let actually reduces? So we've reduced uh, um, the thing to be bound to x to a value, now what happens? There's no inductive premises. All that happens is you immediately get v1 for x and e2. Okay, that's, that's interesting to look at, but we also have a typing derivation to look at. And so that one is going to be let x equals v1 in e2, and so we're going to get um, a subderivation, and then we're going to get another subderivation, which uh, tells us that E2 has the type tau prime under x colon tau. And now take a look at the, these two things right here. So V1 has the type tau and x has the type tau. And that means, because their contexts are also of the right shape, that we can actually just do the substitution. And so now we know that V1 for x in E2 actually has the type tau prime. And that's exactly what we wanted to what we wanted to show here. This v1 for x in E2 is the result of taking a step, and now we've shown that the result of take, that taking a step is actually it's actually well typed. Okay, so um, the high level takeaway here is that um, a programming a typed programming language consists of two things. We have a language or grammar of program terms, and we also need a language or grammar of types. And a type system is a way of hooking up types and terms. It's a way of saying, this expression right here has a particular type, um, and uh, that's, the, that's, that's what the type system is. And we also need a second thing, which is how terms evaluate, and that's our operational semantics. Um, and these two things, the type system and the operational semantics, they're completely disjoint from each other. Um, the way that we figure out their relationship is by doing a type safety proof. It's the thing, the type safety proof is what connects the type theory and its operational semantics. Um, and in general, what you'll find is that proofs about type systems, like type safety, they tend to be intricate, but not overly difficult. And uh, in the next lecture, we're going to look at a significantly more interesting programming language that also has a significantly more interesting logical interpretation. And so I hope to, uh, I hope to uh, um, hear from you soon at the next lecture.